Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Albert Kettner. I'm part of the uh, CSD MESS facility. And I have to, the pleasure to introduce um, our next webinar, which is the last webinar of the spring series. We will continue again in the fall. Um, so the webinar of today is provided by Professor Reed Maxwell and Professor Laura Gordon. Uh, Reed Maxwell is professor at Princeton and Laura Gordon is uh, uh, assistant professor in hydrology and atmospheric sciences at the University of Arizona. Um, and the presentation will be about adventures in developing community modeling platforms. It's gonna be an introduction, I think, to HydroFrame. So with that, um, thank you, Reed, and thank you, Laura, for agreeing to give a presentation and Go ahead. Terrific. Uh, yeah, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity for both of us to uh, kind of tag team this, this talk. Um, so as was mentioned, I read Maxwell of Princeton University, and um, uh, I'm honored to be joined by uh, Professor Laura Condon at University of Arizona. And we're going to talk about adventures in developing community hydrologic map modeling platforms, hydroframe and hydrogen. Um, and a little play on the fact that there's a lot of hydro modeling platforms, uh, not to be confused with hydro share. So part one is hydrology in the supercomputing age. And it's no surprise to any of us on this webinar that we're in the midst of a revolution in computing and data. And computers have advanced substantially over the past half century. This is a really nice uh, kind of pictorial diagram. Um, it's interactive. Uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, computing.lnl.gov history, um, put this together. It's a really neat kind of uh, way to think about how computers have advanced over the years. And of course, two national laboratories um, that were you know, really heavily involved in um, and defense, you know, kind of post World War II, Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos National Laboratories have also hand in hand um, been really innovators in scientific computing. And so we can roll back to sort of 1970, 1969, the new workhorse, the Cray CDC 6600, um, which was the fastest supercomputer in the world then. Now we have uh, the so-called leadership class supercomputers that uh, DOE um, maintains. And the, one of the most recent is Sierra Lassen, which is actually a split machine. There's um, Sierra and Lassen are classified and classified systems. Um, and they're, you know, something like 20 petaflops um, in, in two different machines. And so it's really just incredible advancement. And hydrology has progressed as well. So if we think about what was available for hydrologic models um, in the you know, late 1960s, there were hydrologic models that were actually analog. Uh, models. So resistor networks that you plug together, each resistor was a hydraulic connectivity, um, must have been incredibly arduous to calibrate. And um, that was that was state of the art. We did not you know, really use so-called digital computer models um, in, in those times. And if we move forward, we now have things um, like I'm showing on the right. This is a paper out of Stefan Collette's group that was published in Water a couple years ago. And this was a, um, a prototype uh, operational, experimental operational forecast um, that was bedrock to the top of the atmosphere. Um, fully operational, running in experimental mode, just as a proof of concept to show that you could, over the EU Cordex domain, provide a full, you know, this is plant available water that I'm showing here, forecast of all these hydrologic variables, which is just really incredible, linked to um, the atmospheric for the weather forecast, numerical weather forecast from the German Weather Service. So just this like, immensely amazing advancement. And in fact, as I mentioned, there were no you know, so-called digital hydrologic models um, in the late 60s, but there was the concept for it. And so the concept uh, was really envisioned uh, for this you know, half a century ago. And this is the now, of course, famous blueprint for a physically based digitally simulated hydrologic response model by Fries and Harlan, which was published in Journal of Hydrology in 69. And what's amazing about this is if we show the conceptual model from Fries and Harlan's paper, this conceptual model is quite modern. Um, this, it really very much represents how we think about hydrologic systems even today, right? We have 
you know, different portions of the landscape. We have ET that changes across the landscape. We have precipitation, we have channel flow, we have all of these different components. And then we drop below the subsurface, below the ground surface, and we have groundwater, we have flow lines, we have a water table, um, equipotential lines, you know, really this just very forward looking um, type approach. Now, the catch is that the fastest computers in the world when landmark papers, you know, such as Friesen Harlow are written, are actually much slower than your average smartphone probably in your pocket right now. And in fact, in 50 years, computers have gotten nine times 10 to the ninth times faster. If we look at what the computing power of the Seymour Cray 7600 in 1969 was a 10 megaflop machine. Sierra Lassen combined is 94 petaflops. So if we roll through the cheat sheet, right? A kilo is a thousand, a, thousand, a mega is a thousand kilos, a giga is a thousand megas, a tera is a thousand gigas, a peta is a thousand teras. And now we're talking about exa, which is a thousand petas. And so this is just an incredible, incredible advancement in computing. And if we put, you know, an ancient iPad or an average smartphone, it's in the megaflops to teraflops range. And so Friesen Harlan had this vision, but they didn't have the resources. And so hydrologic modeling has been accelerated by several different movements. First is collaboration between computer scientists, applied mathematicians, and hydrologists. And one of the main reasons for this is that our efficiencies gained from numerical solvers have kept pace with our increases in computer speed. We're not solving the same problems using the same um, applied mathematics approaches that we had in the 1960s. Our applied mathematics has advanced tremendously. And secondly, all modern supercomputers are parallel. So this incredible advancement in computing speed has been as much because of massive parallelization of, of computers that happened in the, in the 90s, as much as it's been advancement on single cores. And so if we look at how the speed up has really changed or how the speed up is realized, we have to understand that our hydrologic models need to take advantage of this. So I'm showing three different examples of uh, so-called weak scaling. So you take a single problem, um, a unit problem size, and then you run it on one processor and then you scale out that unit problem so that each processor, even when you're running out to say 16,000 processors here in parallel, um, or 250 to 500,000 processors, um, or 250 nodes of four GPUs each, the same problem size is the same, the problem size is the same, the unit problem size, but then the overall problem size grows with the number of processors. And we talk about scale parallel efficiency. So how efficiently are we solving a problem that's 16,000 times faster, 16,000 times larger on 16,000 processors um, as opposed to solving this unit problem size. And what you'll notice is that, you know, not only have we evolved in terms of size, but now we've also evolved in terms of platforms. And we're now taking advantage of things like GPUs. All of this requires good software engineering. Now, the second advancement has been open source software and centralized development. And this really provides this transparent community approach, right? So we've had version control for a long time. GitHub has really been this engine to make this very transparent and very easy to use. Um, but there's been several iterations of version control before uh, Git. And what this also does is this brings in things like automated regression tests so that we now have a suite of tests that a code must um, pass so that it's, you know, it's authorized, if you will, or it's transparent that if we make a change to it, if the code advances, that we don't introduce bugs, that we don't introduce backward incompatibilities. And then the other thing is it's very easy for the community to see what the code is and what it's been done, what's been done to it. We can have this transparent version history that's, that's really clear. And so this is an important piece in building this community development. Now, another piece that's really important in building community development are intercomparison workshops. And these are intercomparisons between models, verification problems, benchmark problems, and validation data sets. And these, again, bring the communities together, but they also provide standards and build trust in these complex simulation platforms. Now, lastly, we could give an entire talk just about data. 
data has exploded in the same way that simulations and computing power have exploded. And these new data sets have become widespread, but also these new data sets are open to the community and are really provided in an open, fair way. And that's been an important advancement as well, whether it's data sets that are you know, for comparison, like Google Earth Engine or things that are published in scientific data or data sets that are inputs like the Shing one et al. Uh, depth of bedrock that provide new inputs to our large scale models. So um, I'm up, right, Reed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we started off talking about uh, these advantages in computation because I think it's really important to understand that over the recent decades, this has really fundamentally changed the way that we can solve and even conceive of problems. And so the question is, um, obviously we're not just doing computing for computing's sake, what have we learned from this and how has this helped advance the science? So there's a large hyper-resolution modeling community, um, just as an example, uh, next slide, uh, that has been really pushing the ability to take advantage of these large computing advances to build better large scale models that can help us answer really big questions where we know we need to be looking across large scales at high resolution and where we need to be including a lot of complex processes. Um, next slide. And that's a lot of the work that Reed and I have worked on doing integrated hydrologic modeling. So specifically exploring the role of groundwater surface water interactions and understanding how um, these can play out in our watershed systems, both in the past and in the future. And specifically, uh, we've looked a lot at groundwater, which as many of you probably know, is our largest freshwater reservoir. It's 99% of the world's unfrozen freshwater. 50% of the drinking water that we use in the US comes from groundwater, and it provides 60% of the water for our global agriculture. Um, however, it is also uh, being depleted at an alarming rate. Um, and this is uh, challenging because it's hard to see and hard to model. It's a lot more difficult to understand what's going on in the subsurface than with our streams and our surface water reservoirs. And as a result, it's not included or often really greatly simplified in most of our management models. So I'm gonna provide just a few examples of the kinds of science we've been doing with these models to better understand the role of groundwater in our systems um, and what that can mean for the future. So this is some work from uh, Lauren Thatch that's a student of REITs, a former student of REITs. Um, and she did some really cool analysis combining power flow models, integrated hydrologic models with remote sensing to try to better understand how the human and the natural systems interact. And so what you can see from this graph is first of all that during droughts, we pump more groundwater. That's of course a big picture trend that we know is true. Um, next slide. Um, and what's really cool about this approach is that by combining the integrated hydrologic model with the remote sensing in sophisticated ways, we can actually use this to better understand the human signal on the system. So what you can see here um, is that San, farmers in the San Joaquin may have pumped 1.5 times the flow of the Colorado River in 2014 in this drought as a result of declining surface water supplies. Um, Next slide. So this is this is an example of what we can see uh, with a single study uh, in the Central Valley, but we've also done this nationally. So these are some results from our CONUS simulations um, where we're looking at stream flow declines as a function of groundwater depletion. So we took all of the groundwater pumping that happened over roughly the last hundred years, and we applied that to the model to try to understand long-term stream flow changes. And what we see um, is consistent with a lot of um, observations, but we've been able to do it across the entire US, that we see really significant losses. So in some of our headwater systems, we have simulated stream losses up to 100%. So that's complete loss of small tributaries. And we see that a lot like along the high plains, which is um, something that's been documented. And I think we have a zoom in of the Colorado River um, coming up where you can see that we have really significant, these are still in the 10 to 50% declines in stream flow. And we can connect this to what we're seeing today where we're seeing decreased inflows to Lake Powell as we have a warming and a drying system. And we'll talk about that more um, in a little bit. 
So what we're really seeing too is uh, this is that was the story of historical groundwater pumping, but also we know that our systems are getting drier and there's been previous studies focused on surface water systems that have shown that the hundredth meridian, which is generally, which has historically been the place where evapotranspiration is balanced by precipitation. So we have the more arid part of the country to the west and the more humid to the east. Uh, this used to line up with the hundredth meridian, but it is significantly migrated over the last hundred years. Next slide. Um, and so we can study this with our integrated models. We did some warming simulations where we applied warming to our baseline scenarios and we looked at the change in ET and the change in groundwater storage. And what we see is that as we have warming happen, actually the Eastern basins that are more humid have a stronger evapotranspiration response to that warming because they have shallow groundwater that's available. What's really important about this is that this is a one-way trend. So as that shallow groundwater gets used up, um, that means we would be more sensitive in the future to future droughts because we would have already basically used that buffer. Um, and we can see this happening also in groundwater storage, which is the next slide. Um, and that really what's happening as we're warming our system is that a lot of shallow groundwater is being depleted. So just as humans are turning to groundwater in the drought, our natural systems, if they're storage in the subsurface, will be using that storage um, as we have warming happening. Um, okay, next slide. So this was just a couple of examples, um, and we could have given a talk entirely on the science of integrated modeling and what we can learn about groundwater surface water interactions, both at the regional and the continental scale. Um, but really the point of this section was just to highlight that integrated models are a really powerful tool that can help us see things that we can't necessarily see if we have separated systems models or if we're not including groundwater processes and that the connections between groundwater and plant water availability and stream flow are really important, both in understanding managed systems historically and in understanding how systems are going to evolve in the future. Next slide. Um, so, okay, great. So, so far we've talked about the fact that there have been amazing computing advances that have allowed us to ask different questions, build different models than we've ever been able to do before. Um, and we've shown that that can really facilitate uh, really great science too. Um, but we would argue that this is really not enough, that there's another step to this. And this is where our hydroframe and hydrogen projects come in. So next slide. Uh, I think it should be no surprise to anyone in this group that we're facing really large water challenge challenges that are going to require innovative solutions. A lot of the solutions that we've been using in the past are really not ready for systems that are changing as fast as we're seeing today. Uh, we know that the quantity and the fluxes of water are, are uncertain. Um, we know that moving water around is really costly. Water is heavy, so we can't just easily re-engineer and reconfigure our systems. Um, and we have to think about things across scales. The picture before um, was looking at Lake Mead, a huge reservoir um, that's gathering water from the entire upper Colorado basin. But then we have things like individual irrigators that are making really small scale decisions. And there's many stakeholders involved from the national to the local uh, level. And this is really not a problem that's coming up in 20 years. This is a problem that's happening right now. So I mentioned Lake Mead. Um, I think this is a really good concrete example of kind of what we're up against. So there's a picture of Lake Mead 20 years ago, uh, and there's a picture of Reed at Lake Mead last summer. And uh, it doesn't take too much, uh, you don't have to zoom in too much to see that there's a huge difference in those water levels. And if we went back there today, it would look even worse. Um, and this is causing huge problems as of course, I'm sure you're aware. Um, these are just a couple of headlines. We are seeing the first shortages on the Colorado River that are actually going to force major cuts. Um, and we have uh, shortages declared and actually even California, a really senior uh, water rights holder on the Colorado River could see cuts and we have water planners that are praying for snow. And so far, 2022 is not looking a whole heck of a lot better. Um, so what's really interesting about this, though, is if we look at a time series of what's been happening in the Colorado River, that we actually haven't had 
abnormally low snow years. If you look at the lowest snow years on record, um, those aren't our most recent years. Um, those are um, in the 70s or like 2012. So how are we in this situation where we have such low, historically low water levels? And the issue is that our reservoirs are not just rivers. It's not a surface water uh, system in which we have snow that falls on concrete and makes its way into the river. Um, this is a really interconnected and complex system. So as we have temperature changes, that can change the timing of the snow melt. Um, it can also change the amount of water that plants use, and it can change the balance between how much water infiltrates and how much uh, base flow is provided by groundwater. So it can really change the yield of the basin, which is what we're seeing right now. So this is just one example. Um, overall, though, we're really facing significant challenges as we try to manage these changing systems. Um, we have really sparse observations of the subsurface. We're understanding more and more how important the subsurface is, especially when we're dealing with systems that are warming and changing. Um, and we have a fundamental issue that a lot of our decision-making tools have relied on relationships that have been derived based on observations of the past. And the one thing we're sure of is that the future is going to look different. We don't know what it's gonna look like, but we know it's gonna look different. Um, and in many significant ways that we're expecting. Um, and we can't just model parts of the system in isolation. We know that these are complicated and interconnected. Uh, so Reed, do you wanna take it from there? Sure. Uh, can you, everybody still hear me okay? Mm -hmm. no, I, okay, I, great. Yeah, my, every, everything has automatically switched around on my computer. So apologies for that if it's, if it causes disruption. So what can we do, right, as a community? Um, well, we have a number of things that we can do. We can democratize model access. We can embrace hybrid solutions. We can decrease the gap between science and application, and we can engage the community. And so this is where the community platforms that Laura and I have been um, hard at work with others, uh, this is a really big team that we're representing here, um, that we've really been striving for. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is democratizing model access. Um, and our scientific solutions are not enough because we have these great science breakthroughs that come from computing, that come from application of hydrologic modeling to computing. Um, but we also have big challenges in computation data and workflow. And we need things to change these. And so the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of this approach is the HydroFrame platform. Um, and HydroFrame is a National Science Foundation uh, cyber infrastructure project. We're very grateful uh, to the National Science Foundation. We're also very grateful uh, to our large number of, of collaborators and partners. Um, there's something like 10 co-PIs from seven institutions, um, including you know, some, of, uh, some of the folks on this call. Um, and it's been really a great community engagement project. You'll notice that uh, Utah State, Kawasi, uh, NCAR, um, and, and Boise State, in addition to um, Princeton and University of Arizona. So what HydroFrame, um, what HydroFrame's goals are is to take these large national model development, uh, national scale model development efforts that we have been undertaking. I mean, what I'm showing here are some early results from CONUS-2. So this is a simulated water table depths of our CONUS-2 domain, which are the result of just a huge effort to improve topography, pull together better soil and land cover data sets, and then really a, a robust subsurface, as I'm showing here, right? So we went from five to 10 uh, subsurface layers. We have semi-confining or confining units. We really tested a number of different geological, 3D geologic and with depth of bedrock, um, so transition between um, alluvial and hard rock aquifers um, in this new model. And we really wanted to find a way to make this easier for the community to use. And so this is the idea behind um, HydroFrame. And what I'm showing here is the Kwasi subsetter. So what you can do in HydroFrame is you can select um, a, a watershed and then automatically run a PowerFlow CONUS simulation and prepare all the data using cloud containers with a whole range of options. Um, and so some of the things that you might be able to do is you can automatically subset and then launch PowerFlow CONUS. Um, this is running on uh, the Princeton Hydro Data Center. 
Um, this is an example of just a, you know, the job dashboard where this is running. And then you can go in and view results of the simulation and get different kinds of dashboard type information. And it really provides this flexible output um, in this really easy interactive dashboard type approach. Now, beyond this, this is really just the front end for a backend API that is API accessible. So we're working hard on connections to HydroShare, connections to other platforms that provide this real interoperability between data and simulation. So I guess it's still me. So we envision a democratized community water platform for the US where these large scale simulations are easily accessible. Platforms and portals allow us to run simulations. Um, and then a piece that I'm gonna hand off on is customized machine learning emulators for a broad range of users. And so I'm gonna hand this back over to yeah, Laura about embracing hybrid solutions. Yeah, so we talked about um, the HydroFrame project, which is where we're really providing access to the physics-based simulations and trying to make these more of a community resource. Um, but we're also working on additional solutions where we can combine machine learning with the physically-based models. So um, really the motivation for this is that we have a growing wealth of Earth system observations and machine learning capabilities. We have so much data, Reed mentioned this at the beginning, we have so much more data today to work with. Um, and we have these advances in machine learning, which can potentially really accelerate what we're doing. Um, however, uh, there's still a lot of gaps. Observations are really valuable, but they can't tell us the whole story for a couple of reasons. Um, we have local measurements, which are difficult to scale. That's especially true with groundwater observations, which are point observations, and we can't take advantage of the fact that it's like a network, like Streamflow. Um, we have a really great um, quantity of new remote sensing data, um, but it can't see everything. They're often still relying on models, and the spatial or temporal resolution might be limited. Um, and then in addition, all of the observations we have are fundamentally limited by the fact that our systems are changing. And so it will be hard if we're relying only on data to predict changing dynamics that might not look in the future like anything we've been able to observe in the past. So models are really a great tool to help bridge this gap. And I have a picture of our PowerFlow model in the middle here, an integrated, you know, physically based hydrologic model. Um, and you might say, well, why not just have that be a machine learning model? And I think um, that there's a lot of kind of um, false, <laughs> false competition between machine learning and physics-based models because the, the answer is really yes and. We need all of the solutions that we can bring to the table to try to accelerate and better understand what's happening with our systems. So in the hydrogen project, we're combining physics-based models with machine learning. And the reason for combining the physics-based models with the machine learning is so that we can generate simulations of things that haven't been seen in the past. So if we do purely a data-driven approach, um, we run the risk of having our models really go off the rails when we start to look at the future. Um, as with HydroFrame, this is a really a uh, large team and a large collaboration. It's co-led by Reed and I, so University of Arizona and Princeton, working really closely with the Cybers team at University of Arizona. Um, that's a large NSF cyber infrastructure project. And we have um, early adopters and have been collaborating closely with the Bureau of Reclamation, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the real goal of what we're doing is combining the physics-based solutions with machine learning so that we can generate scenarios of a future that might not look like the past. And what's cool about this is that with the machine learning em emulators, we can uh, run things that are up to a thousand times faster than the hydrologic models. Next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just one example of a, um, a convolutional model that we've set up. And the point is we can use the physics-based model to train the machine learning emulator. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that uh, already with our preliminary results, we can do a really great job. If you look at these two uh, models, our machine learning emulator and our machine, um, our machine learning emulator and our hydrologic model, you really can't tell these two solutions apart. And so what this allows us to do is really do more work trying to understand risk to run large scale and long-term simulations um, because we can cut our simulation times by orders of magnitude. Um, next slide. 
So I mentioned the, the hybrid solutions really trying to bring together everything that we currently have. We have all this computing power, we have all this data. Um, so how can we combine them to try to get better answers faster? Um, but I think there's another issue here, which is where both the HydroFrame and the HydroGem project come in, which is trying to decrease the gap between science and application. Uh, there's a challenge that a lot of the best science is really hard to get out of academia uh, due to all of these workflow challenges that Reed has talked about. Uh, so the hydrogen project is an NSF convergence accelerator, which you might've heard of. The idea between, behind the convergence accelerators is that they're really use-inspired convergence research um, and really focused on advancing ideas from concepts to deliverables that can help society. And so through this project, um, we've really focused on taking a user-centered design approach um, which means you spend a lot of time talking to potential users and finding out if what you think is the solution they want is actually the solution they want, uh, which requires a lot of asking questions and listening, as opposed to what we normally do with our scientific results, which is present them <laughs> for feedback. So we had to actually kind of take a step back and say, okay, we think this is we think this is what we want to do, but it actually is this something that people need? Is this something that they want? Um, and discover what it is they're needing before we do our designing and our testing. And so next slide. Uh, so we did a user-centered design process where we talked to people, we asked them what the problems were, what their challenges were. Um, we did more than 20 user interviews to understand the challenges that they're facing, do groups brainstorming and low fidelity prototyping. We also did workshops uh, for the HydroFrame project to understand people's workflows and understand what they're doing. And really, this has really strongly informed our application prototyping and how we go about doing this. Next slide. So um, this isn't to say this is a perfect process, um, but I think there's some important lessons learned here. Um, and that is that better science, uh, first of all, better science doesn't necessarily lead to better outcomes unless you have significant user engagement and investment in infrastructure. So um, it's not that we always have to be striving for better user um, outcomes. Um, better science is valuable in itself too. But if you want something that can be used and can help people make better decisions in real time, um, it's really not going to happen unless you're engaging users early on and you have a way to invest in infrastructure. And when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about things like applications and platforms that users are, can actually use other than just a scientific um, publication and a pointer to a, a GitHub repo. So things to make things really accessible for a diverse group of um, people. Um, and I think this is not to knock our normal approach to doing science. I don't think this is really how most projects are set up um, because uh, we don't really usually have support for things like software developers. So one thing that is really cool about uh, both the hydrogen and the hydroframe project is we've been able to put resources towards developing um, this infrastructure. And I'll hand it back. So one of the last things we want to talk about what we can do um, is we can engage the community. And computing provides unique challenges and opportunities uh, for education outreach. Um, and I'm showing two different um, images here. This is actually from a, a workshop we had um, in person before AGUs, this was 2019, um, where we, for HydroFrame, started a user elicitation process and really started to understand what users wanted, um, which was very valuable. The other thing that I'm showing here, the other image I'm showing here is um, some direct education outreach work that we've been doing with K-12 students are an example of it, um, obviously with a stream table. And, you know, we engage hydrologists uh, with this, to understand this range of user stories. And then we can also connect K-12 students with hydrologic processes. Now, one of the really valuable tools has been the Santank Aquifer. This has been incredibly valuable. This is the so-called ant farm, um, Santank Aquifer shown here, where you have water flowing in um, on one side, flowing out on the other. Actually, I had this wrong. It's flowing into your right and it's flowing out to the left. Um, and you know, it's, it's filled with different um, materials and you know, provides a, a visual example you could put dye in, provides a visual example um, of how groundwater works and some basics of groundwater surface water interaction, pollution, pollution, et cetera. And this is uh, Dr. Lisa Gallagher, who's the Education Outreach Coordinator for the High Meadows Environmental Institute um, and supports all of the projects that we've been talking about here, um, who's developed a number of really successful approaches. Now, what we really needed was a mechanism both to teach hydrologic modeling um, 
and ways to teach remotely, um, you know, hydrologic processes remotely, and to overcome some of the limitations of the sand tank, right? So this is an amazing tool, but you know, you do more than a few dye injections, um, and it takes hours to clean up the sand tank. There's not an easy way to reset it. If you have a long education event, you need multiple sand tanks. They're expensive. You need to repack them. So there's a lot of advantages to having the ability to do this um, in a different format. And so what we did was we built um, a representation of the sand tank aquifer uh, in a gamified hydrologic model interface, running a hydrologic model. So we could have visual representation of the water table, ability to pump or inject water, adjust boundary conditions and materials all on the fly. And this is live. Um, this was a collaboration between University of Arizona Integrated Groundwater Modeling Center, Princeton, and Kitware, the software company. Um, you can launch it, santank.hydroframe.org. It's running on a large server um, here at Princeton. And this is an interactive PARFLOW model with the Santank aquifer. So you can you know, adjust boundary conditions, you can change material properties, you can run different scenarios, um, and it's even templatable. So you can generate different, and we have generated different templates. So you could have a watershed template or there's a, a Tucson um, TCE contamination template. And it's just been this very highly flexible approach. Um, we also wanted to develop gamified applications to teach machine learning. Um, and so this is, again, some work that Lisa Gallagher led, but notice this is in close collaboration with uh, Professor Joe Williams, who is um, the director of the, the WISE Women in Science Education Program at University of Arizona. And this is sort of further our collaboration between these two institutions um, with a large team, including a research software engineer um, at, at Princeton and um, folks from Kitware as well. And we built what's called Santank ML, which is a machine learning um, education outreach tool. And what's really neat about this is Lisa sort of took this to one step farther. Um, we have the ability to have a character sort of narrate the applications. This is Dr. Sandy Loam who walks the user through how to run um, the Parflow sand tank and then build a machine learning model for it um, and you know, kind of walk everybody through this process. And these machine learning emulators can be immediately compared to Parflow. So you can make different choices about the emulators. You can run Parflow and then run the emulator um, and not only get an understanding of how well it does visually, but you can get quantitative estimates of errors and things like this. And this is also live running also on a Princeton server, um, santank-ml.hydroframe.org. Um, and you know, you're welcome to check this out. So this is just a quick snapshot. Um, we really thank you all very, very much. Um, for giving us the opportunity to kind of give you a quick tour over some of the things that we've been doing. Um, and on behalf of Laura and I, you know, we'd be happy to take any questions and, and have plenty of time for discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Reed. Thank you, Laura. This is awesome. This is very inspiring talk. Uh, and I, I wrote down the, the websites to go play, uh, play around. Um, okay, the, um, like what Reed said, um, we're open for discussion. Maybe good if you could raise your hand. You, you can unmute yourself. You can turn on your video if you want um, to ask any questions. Um, and while we're waiting for the first question, I I actually have one. Um, when when I was listening to your talk, you're you're mostly talking about how to make models and and our logical resources available to the public, right? To make them more aware, I guess, and to, 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 to close the gap between science and, and the community. But there is less talk about um, how to involve uh, uh, government, uh, the government body that, uh, that has put uh, in place the water right regulations and those kind of things that um, might affect uh, the water table and the availability of water uh, quite a bit. Can you reflect on, you know, on that, the, the importance of the government, government water rights and, and can there be done anything through science to maybe change some of those water rights? Um, yeah, I'll go for it and then you can augment. Um, so I think the answer is sort of yes and no. Um, so the water rights are 
you know, really legal entities. And, and there's a lot of, of course, discussion of so-called paper water, which might be different than, um, than wet water or the actual water available. Um, what I would say, something that we do quite a bit is, um, and this is through the hydrogen project, is the goal of the hydrogen project is to provide um, democratized data and water, you know, hydrologic short-term forecast simulations, so three to six month form, um, outlook type risk-based simulations broadly to decision makers, municipal, um, you know, city municipal water managers, um, folks who don't otherwise have these capabilities in house. And the idea is to provide this, you know, more level playing field about how much water do we have right now? How much water might be available in your, um, in your watershed? And then how might that change over the next three to six months? And this really came out of the design process that Laura talked about. So um, Dr. Lindsay Barrup, who's at the Bureau of Reclamation um, Technical Services Center, uh, was has been a partner in hydrogen since the beginning. Um, and a lot of what uh, Lindsay's group does is support the uh, science needs for the Bureau of Automation, you know, really decision makers. So those who are saying, all right, let's pull a lever on a dam, let's release water, let's not release water, what is the state? And it's the TSC's off office's job to really support that. And so a lot of this, um, a lot of this really was driven by those needs of that office and how to better communicate with those making these making these types of decisions. And so that was a real driver, but then this is broadened to municipalities, um, small municipalities that have to make water decisions very similarly, um, and even um, urban design and, you know, understanding uh, how to better design the urban landscape. There's been a this sort, of, sort of explosion of different use cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Reed. Um, I see David has his hand up. Go ahead. Okay. So I thought I would jump in following a little bit on the, the government point. And firstly, great presentation, Reed. It's good to see this. And I know I'm helping with some of it. Um, what about other models? I guess you described uh, mostly work with PAR flow. Uh, another part of the government is the National Water Center working on uh, a new next generation model that's uh, is also going to be maybe part of the solutions. Um, and then when you think about the Colorado, there've been a lot of National Academy type reports that have relied heavily on the VIC model. So, and I know CSDMS is all about sort of model interoperability and model many models. So what is your thinking about how to, I guess, sort out uh, which model should be used? So um, I'll go first, Um I think that, um, so we've been doing a lot of work with Parflow because that's that's where we started with. But the idea is not really to say this is the best model and the only model. This is the model that we have resources and are building tools around. And all of the platforms that we've been working on developing, we've made really big efforts to make everything we do open source and to try to follow standards that can be community standards. So other models would be welcome to um, be a part of HydroFrame or be a part of any of the things we're doing. Um, and I think that as, as we mentioned at a couple points in the talk, I mean, the answer is really not that we need one best model. We need everybody to bring whatever tools they have and to make those tools more accessible. So I see what we're doing with HydroFrame and Hydrogen as doing that with the models that we're working with right now, but also trying to provide roadmaps for how we can do that with other models. And um, I think everything that we've done, we've really focused on being open source and inclusive. Uh, Read on if you have more. Yeah, no, I definitely want to augment your great response because I think the big, the big takeaway is all of the software is open source, all of the data is open access, and it's not just you know to sort of Laura's point about. You know, it's not enough just to satisfy a, a National Science Foundation, DOE, or journal, you know, data management plan. It's really about not only are we providing these data, we're committing to housing them, we're committing to housing these model results and providing open access tools to diving in and grabbing these results and then um, providing them in a way that they are part of an ecosystem. So all of the things that we develop, um, we leverage, you know, big projects like X-Array and other big data management projects to make things interoperable instead of redoing things that we're already doing and connections to HydroShare and such. And so a big part of this is to make this more open 
um, but then also build the ecosystem. And then as Laura said, you know, we're a totally open club. So there's no, like we use the model that we're gonna use because that's the model that we're familiar with. And that's the, you know, we, we a lot of these things are very research oriented, right? So all of the machine learning emulation and all the training, everything is super, is super research based. And there's a lot of work just to get to that point. And so if we had to like do multiple models or, or expand out that scope, it would just be too much. But that doesn't mean that we're, you know, we would provide this platform and then it's, it's free and open access. So somebody else could say, hey, this is great. I want to do this, um, you know, in another domain, which is similar to say what um, Pierre Gentine is doing with, um, with his NSF ERC, or sorry, um, STC um, around climate models or might be done in other hydrologic modeling domains. It's an open community and, you know, we should all be sharing and, and building. Thank you. I see two other questions. Uh, Mark first. Reed and Laura, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a, a probably a quick and maybe trivial question, but as a research software engineer and a happy CMake user, how did you collaborate with Kitware? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so we were already CMake, we were already like CMake compatible and all those things. We've been pretty, pretty, um, and, and glad to hear there's other research software engineers other places and glad to hear you're using the R in the research software engineer. Um, I've been heavily engaged um, in PIXI, which is the Princeton Institute for Scientific Computing um, here. I'm on the steering committee and been a big proponent of uh, Princeton's leadership around research software engineering. So that's a really great thing. Okay, so how do we get involved with Kitware? Um, they, you know, contacted us and we started chatting some a number of years ago and had shared interests and we wrote a pre-proposal and then we wrote a um a, a doe uh sbir um it, it's a phase one which was a small kind of seed proposal um and then things really just sort of bloomed from there and so we were really lucky that we could get them interested in a bunch of different things so there was a lot of work that was done. Um, and a lot of this was by one of Laura's former master's students who did a, a long-term internship um, with Kitware. So we modernized, um, we had actually a TCL, um, full TCL interface to Parflow that was you know, built when, when Python didn't even exist. Um, and, you know, and we wanted to have this script ability and key database for input for Parflow. Um, and, you know, there was obviously much outdated and that really needed to be updated in Python and be very Pythonic. And so um, that was one of the big things that they did. That was one of the big outcomes of the SBIR. But then we got them really interested in things like, hey, let's build this, you know, gamified interface using a bunch of Kitware tools. Um, so that's Fairview Web Services and, you know, a bunch of other things that are sitting on top of the, the SARC architecture and, and Santank and Santank ML. But we were just really lucky that we could engage software engineers in this. And then now with Kitware, uh, sorry, with Cybers, um, we've got a really great collaboration and really great relationship with them that Laura has built um, over the years that she's been at um, University of Arizona. Um, and then, you know, we've hired in our own software team and split between the two groups and two institutions and but we all function as one larger team. And so we've been really, really lucky and that everybody's been so um, like amenable to this. Hopefully that was an answer to your question, not just yeah, a lot of cheerleading. It's all good, thank you. And I see one last question uh, from uh, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, thanks, Albert. Hi, Laura. Hi, Reed. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm glad I just kind of on a whim saw that you were presenting on this topic and I thought I really wanted to hear this talk. I, I um, was interested in the Convergence Accelerator project because you know, there's a lot of focus at NSF on translational research and there's the new directorate for technology innovation and partnerships and I don't think all um, all members of the academic community see a space for you know tapping into this these new funds for translational research so I was really excited to see that you were able to kind of you know find find this entry point and so I was curious um, you know you talked about user-centered design and using user interview interviews to develop prototypes and do user testing. I was wondering if you could talk to us briefly about 
who that user community is. Um, you know, is it a non-academic audience? Is it an academic audience? Like, do, do, is it is it is it all of it? I'm curious about the user community. Like, what what's the trans audience for that translation, and um, what kind of deliverables you're pitching through the Convergence Accelerator program? Thanks. Um, sure, I can go first if you want, Reed. Um, so yeah, that's a really great question, and the Convergence Accelerator project has been um, really interesting and is. Um, I think we knew reading the RFP for it that it's really a very different kind of NSF project, um, but I don't think we fully understood how, how different of an NSF project it is until going through it. And I think, uh, yeah, Reed's shaking his head vigorously because it has been, it's been a really interesting experience. And I think what's really different about the Convergence Accelerator is that NSF, um, I mean, there's a couple of things, but NSF is really pushing and has you structure your budgets around really having support for doing things like user-centered design and for software development. So in other projects, you might do those activities, but you would need to be doing them like with grad students, which is really hard because that has to somehow fit into their research and the timeline of a grad student. Um, within the Convergence Accelerator, we have a user experience team. Um, there's user experience specialists at Princeton who are professionals working there that have experience doing things like running interviews, doing interface design, stuff like that. We have software developers who are um, just full-time software developers who are who are doing that and designing and building it. Um, we do also have postdocs and scientists who are doing research, but their job is to really do research on the machine learning. And that's different from this process. So I do think it's really, it's structured intentionally very differently. And it's very hands-on in terms of um, both in phase one and phase two, we've had weekly training sessions on how to um, do user-centered design, how to think about how to make your platform sustainable, how you could get income from it, things like that. So um, I would say it is, it's really intentionally structured different and it's very hands-on. Um, with respect to your question about the um, community, so far, the community we've really engaged our uh, water resources managers. So we've, we've talked to government agencies, um, federal government agencies, local agencies, local water providers, state agencies. Um, we've talked to a lot to people who do consulting in the water area, and that's that's mostly been our focus. We've also been collaborating with the Wi-Fi team in California that does real-time um, fire forecasting. And then in phase two, we've expanded to think more about um, more corporate interests. So things like insurance and reinsurance. Um, but I would say that it's really time consuming and a lot of effort. And if there's not resources and a structure that support that, I don't see how that's really possible within our normal academic framework because it's just not, it's not the kinds of things we have time for or um, support to do. So it's really interesting. And I think people who are interested in it should look into the new NSF programs and how they work because it is really structured pretty differently. Uh, Reed, do you have can I ask you, oh, yeah, can I ask you a follow-up question? Just yeah. like, just to expand on something you said, because you said you need all this support. Like you talked about people who are experts in like mm -hmm. this kind of user-centered yeah. design and, and the software developers. Is that support that was provided by the Convergence Accelerator? Or I mean, you had to have that support in place in order to be competitive in the Convergence Accelerator program? Um, I think that the fact that we had a team that was trained in that probably helped our proposal. I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't there when they reviewed it. But I think the key was that it's something we could write into our budget and we could have hired consultants to do that if we wanted. Um, just that it, it's, it's hugely, it's great to interview people, but it's hugely time consuming to figure out those people, set up things, set up follow, you know, it's, it's just a big job. Um, Reed, did you have anything you wanted to add? About yeah, it? no, I'll, I'll add a little bit. That was a terrific answer, Laura. And the things that I'll add is one that um, it is a really different NSF um, type project. And generally, my working assumption, having you know had a lot of NSF support uh, over the years, is that any rule from your regular NSF, um, anything that's a rule against something in a regular NSF uh, project is flipped and it's encouraged in the convergence accelerator and vice versa. So like you're discouraged from having students because it's a deliverable driven thing. You're encouraged to have a lot of software professionals. You're encouraged to have, you can have a, a program officer or you know, program manager who helps track, track, track tasks. And it's, you know, just the number of things that, that you were sort of doing that are way outside what normally a faculty member would do is, 
is really, um, it's been very interesting. Um, and I will say that it, it's been hugely helpful to have the infrastructure at Princeton, like that we have a user experience design uh, office, that we already have a really um, significant research software engineering group, and that we can add software engineers, research software engineers who are embedded in our project, but also have co-supervision through the research software engineering group. There's a lot of these mechanisms that have been very helpful. It's been incredibly helpful to partner with cybers because they off, they operate very differently, and that's been a you know real benefit. Um, but I will say that you know what it's enabled has just been really incredible because what we've built and what we've been able to do is really different um, and never would have happened. It would have been five years to a decade to to accelerate what we've done, and so really like focusing this in and then understanding the user need. We built this, you know, 17 member advisory board. Um, it's a very different, you know, swath of people that are interested in water, um, but that are very important roles, but that would not otherwise be um, people that we would normally understand and, and you know, build, build, try to build solutions for. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Reed, for, for this wonderful webinar.